Hello, YouTubers and fellow hams. Well, this is part three in my Beginner's 3D Printing for Ham Radio series. And in the first part, we looked at the printer and the printer that I chose to go with, the Monoprice Select Mini, mostly because it fit in my budget. And uh, I mentioned that there's others and uh, alternatives that have larger print areas for doing larger cases and things for projects and so on. Um, in the second part, we talked about modeling parts and I showed you a very simple a modeling program in Tinkercad that you can use to design parts quickly and easily for 3D printing. And in this part, part three, we're going to look at slicers. And this is one of the more difficult aspects of 3D printing. What is a slicer? Well, when you start with a 3D model, uh, it, it's a mesh. It's a solid object defined mathematically. Well, the 3D printer is going to lay that down in layers basically cross sections, one slice at a time. And the slicer is the program that processes that model and creates the G-code file that the printer needs in order to operate. Now, the 3D printer itself is a really stupid device. It doesn't have very much in the way of intelligence in it. All it knows how to do is interpret G-code. And G-code is a script that was uh, developed in uh, industrial applications for controlling automated machinery. It's a very, very simple script. All the commands, if you could call them that, are basically G and a number followed by some parameters. And they, that tells the machine basically to move, move the tool. Um, in the case of a 3D printer, the tool is a nozzle. And all the printer knows how to do is to move that around on the X, Y, and Z axes and to turn the tool on or off or extrude filament in this case, pushing plastic down into the nozzle to melt and come out as a bead. That's all the printer knows how to do. And that's all the G code can tell it to do is to move the tool by millimeters in one direction or another, absolutely or relatively, to extrude filament um, and to raise or lower the uh, tool. That's it. That's all that that script can tell it to do. So you can imagine that programming a machine like a 3D printer to draw an object takes a lot and a lot of little commands. Move the nozzle in this direction while extruding filament at this speed. Move the nozzle in this direction this far at this speed while extruding this much filament. You know what I mean? It's, that's what G-code is. It's a step-by-step -step instruction for the machine to just move a tool around. So converting a 3D model into uh, cross-sectional slices and then computing the g-code involved to how to draw that slice is is quite a bit of work and that's what the slicer is it's the program that's going to do that conversion for you it also has complete and total control over the machine every aspect of it um, the process of filament depository manufacturing or this this 3d printing there's a lot of physics involved there's a lot going on with that plastic with surface tension with gravity um, with the speed at which it melts and oozes out the nozzle it's a very precise art and so the slicer uh, it has a lot of settings a lot of parameters it is the program within which you can thoroughly frustrate yourself if you screw around with some of these settings and get them wrong. And so uh, it's a difficult subject to approach and simplify. However, there are slicers out there that have made it fairly simple for beginners to use. And that's what I'm going to focus on. Uh, there are commercial slicers uh, that are available. If you're under Windows, there's a really popular one called Simplify 3D. You have to purchase it, but it really does an excellent job of doing that conversion for you. In the free software market, the open source market, um, there are a couple of major contenders. Uh, one is called Simply Slicer, S-L-I-C, and then the E's flipped around to a 3 and the letter R. Some people call it Slick 3R. It's been around since the hobbyist 3D printers. It was one of the first slicers to be developed. Uh, it's pretty easy to use. And it gives you a lot of control and a lot of parameters that you can mess around with and tune for your printer. 
uh, but it's not the one I'm going to be looking at. What I'm going to be looking at is one called Cura. Now, a company that made 3D printers early in the game, Ultimaker, they developed Cura to be an easy front end for their users uh, to use to create their 3D prints. So it's, it's very simple to work with. It's very commonly chosen as a slicer for students in educational applications, um, libraries uh, where they have 3D printers for the public to use and so on. You usually will find Cura as the slicer being used. Now, Cura has a lot of those settings already at defaults that have been developed through the years and known to work. So you don't have to mess with very much. Uh, we're going to go over to the computer. I'm going to load up Cura, and I'm going to show you um, how you would configure it for your printer in the simplest possible fashion, and then how you would load a model and how you would slice it to prepare it for 3D printing. All right, we're over here on the computer. And we're going to talk about Cura. Now, as I said, Ultimaker is the company that uh, released Cura generously into the public. They made um, some of the earliest commercially available 3D printer kits and completed products that were ready to, to use out of the box. And if you go to their website at Ultimaker.com and you look under uh, products, you'll see over to the right, software. And if we go over here, there's Ultimaker Cura. And we'll click on that. And this is where you can download Cura. Now, it's gonna sense your operating system. In my case here, right there, it says Linux. They, they know I'm under Linux. And if I click download, it's just gonna show me the Linux version. But if I click this view all versions, we should find Cura for Windows with the revision numbers. We scroll down, there's the version for Mac. And we scroll down further, further, and there is the version for Linux. So it's supported on all three of the platforms. So you'll want to download and install Cura. And then once you've got it installed, and the first time you run it, it's going to come up and it's going to ask you to define your printer. Now, I've already defined mine, so it's not showing me that, but I'll, I'll take you to that area where you define your printer. And this is where you have to set everything up. Uh, okay, printers. I'm going to click Add Printer, and this will show you the dialog that you'll see when you first run Kira. When you first run it, it's going to come up, and it's, they're going to assume you've got an Ultimaker, of course, because it's their product. Um, under Other, there's quite a few other common printers listed that you can choose from. You can see the Prusas are in here, Rigid, TiVo Tarantula, the Vertex, um, a lot of the popular printers. Now, in my case, I have the Monoprice um, Mini, which is not listed, so I had to use Custom. If you have one of these printers, though, um, setup is painless. When you select this profile, it'll pull in all the common settings for your printer. But I'm going to go to Custom and select Custom Printer. And that's how we would uh, do it for setting up for the uh, monoprice or uh, what other printer you might have that's not listed under other. You'll give it a name here. I'm just going to leave it as Custom because I'll be deleting this profile. But you would name it here and click Add Printer. And then eventually, there we go, machine settings. It's going to come up and it's going to ask you for some basic settings for your printer. Now, at minimum, this is all you have to do is go through and set these settings and you'll have working presets um, that will probably produce good prints for you. There's lots of things you can tweak down the road as you learn about it, but these settings will get you started. All right, so we'll go through these one at a time. So up here, we have X width, Y depth, and Z height. These are the maximum build settings for your printer, or the maximum area that your printer can cover. Uh, a lot of the larger bed printers will be 200 millimeters by 200 millimeters by 200 millimeters. In the case of the Monoprice Select Mini, which I have, it's 120 by 120 by 120. 
So we have to enter that build area. Build plate shape. Um, with most of the Cartesian coordinates printers, like, like the uh, Monoprice Mini, where you've got X, Y, and Z, and it's a square bed, um, your build plate shape will be, well, you select rectangular, even if it is square. If you have a delta printer, uh, which has the three arms that come down to the carriage and move it around, they always have a round build plate, so you'd select elliptic. But uh, in our case, it's rectangular. Origin at center. Uh, very few printers will this apply to. This is talking about the home position. When you tell your printer to home, where does it home? Some of them, and I think it might be some of the deltas, um, will home at center, but not very many. Most of them you'll leave this unchecked because you're homing at a corner of the printer. So like with the Monoprice Mini, it's homing at a corner. Heated bed. The build plate on the printer, um, most of them should have a heated bed, meaning they can heat that bed up to help keep the print, print the plastic adhered to it so that it doesn't cool and curl up at the ends. Uh, in my case, the Mini Select does have a heated bed, so I'll check that. G-code flavor, in most cases you're going to leave this alone. Marlin is the open source um, firmware that they've written for the, the Arduino inside these printers, and it's the most common. There are other specific choices, and if you have some printers, you need to choose these. Um, RepRap is the earlier Prusas and most of the common Prusas. That's uh, the open source firmware that's been tweaked and modded for those printers. It's usually a safe choice as well. I could probably choose RepRap and it'll work. But in most cases, you're going to leave that at Marlin, unless you have a specific printer like the Ultimaker, the Griffin, the MakerBot, and so on. So we'll just leave that at Marlin for my printer. You'll have to, uh, you might have to find out for your printer if it's different what firmware you have and choose the proper one here. Um, print head settings, I don't believe we have to change anything in there. Um, Gantry height, I don't know why they default this to 999.99. And I don't know that it makes a lot of difference if you put another number in there. I always put in 100. I need to research exactly what they're talking about there. It doesn't seem to affect the operation of my printer if I change that much. But I'm not going to leave it at 999.99.99 because for some reason that just makes me feel like that would cause problems. Number of extruders. A few higher end printers will have multiple nozzles and can take multiple filaments at the same time for uh, two or three color printing. In our case, we only have one, so we'll leave that at one. Material diameter. Okay, this is the diameter of the filament. The Select Mini takes 1.75 millimeter filament, and that's one of the more common ones nowadays. The earlier printers had a 0.5 millimeter nozzle and they took the larger, um, well, they've got 2.85 in here. It's commonly referred to as 3 millimeter. But in my case, for the Monoprice Select Mini, I need to change that to 1.75. And then finally, nozzle size, which is the nozzle size on your printer. And that should be listed in your printer's manual, your specifications. Most of them nowadays are 0.4 millimeters. You can buy different nozzles. You can buy as small as 0.2, I think, and as large as one millimeter. So depending upon your particular printer, you need to set this to match your nozzle size. Now they have put some default start and end G-code in here. And this, these, this is what the printer does when it starts the print. And these are some defaults that, uh, that do a few basic things here. Um, it homes all the uh, axes right here. It uh, lifts the uh, nozzle 15 millimeters and primes the extruder, which means it feeds a little bit of filament through the extruder to, to push it into the nozzle, push out any um, air that's in there and get it ready to go. And then it does a couple of moves before it starts printing. And then the, in, the end G-code um, does a couple of things here, retracts the filament. I think one of these slows down the cooling fan and homes the, uh, the uh, printer. 
when it's done printing. So you could actually customize this. If you know what you're doing with G-Code, you could get in here and make changes and customize what your printer does when it starts and stops. But in most cases, you won't have to. So these basic settings are the minimum that you have to enter to get this working for your printer. And in most cases, this is all you're going to have to do. Um, once you have been printing for a while and you, you know a little bit more about the process and what the different things mean, um, you might, might want to go in deeper and, and do more settings and more tweaks and, and so on. Cura will give you full control over your printer. There's, there's hundreds of settings in here, but don't mess with them unless you know what they are because you can get yourself frustrated real quick. So I'll finish and it has now created my custom printer setting. The last thing I need to do is hit activate to tell it that that's the profile I want to use. I'm not going to do that because I've already got my, my printer defined. I'll just leave that set. Okay, up here on the left side of preferences there is this settings tab. And this is where you can tell Cura what settings to show you in the main interface. Okay, you can put check marks here besides all the things that you want to be able to control over here on the right when you are slicing for your printer. They give you a bunch of defaults here that are just the main basic things you might need to fiddle with. Um, I would recommend just leaving it as is for now unless you know what you're doing. If, you, if you've had a 3D printer for a while, um, why are you watching this video about Kira? But that aside, <laughs> um, as you learn and as you progress with 3D printing and begin to understand more about the physics and what's happening, it might be useful to go in here and activate um, some of these other settings. <coughs> Still not quite over that uh, chest infection. Man, I'm over it. I'm just clearing out. Sorry about the coughs. Okay, anyway, um, the settings are broken down into categories. Uh, there's all kinds of control that you can have over things. Shell refers to the outermost part of your part. You know, the, the wall that's on the outside edge of your, of your part. You can control all kinds of stuff here. How many layers it's going to use, how thickness um, you want them to be, how thick you want them to be, um, how many top and bottom layers you want. You know, it, it allows you to just take absolute control, but, but we're not going to activate any of these right now because they, they can just be confusing for a beginner. Infill. Um, infill is inside... If, if you're modeling a part, okay, to save on plastic, you don't want it to be solid all the way through because that's just a waste of plastic. Infill is a pattern that it draws inside to fill in the inside of it with uh, less plastic. And there's different patterns. There's like hexagonal patterns like a, a beehive, a honeycomb pattern, lines, grids. And there's advantages to um, disadvantages to, to all of them. And, and again, that's something that just comes with time and understanding. So you really don't want to probably mess with any of that um, uh, at the beginning. So as I said, you can go in here and activate all kinds of things and take all kinds of control over your printer um, down the road as you learn what you're doing. <laughs> but we'll, leave, uh, we'll just leave the defaults for now. So this is the main interface for Cura. We have a representation of our printer's bed here. And the mouse controls are very similar to Tinkercad. If I click the scroll wheel, I can shift my view up and down, left and right. Scrolling the wheel zooms in and out. The right hand mouse button lets me change the orientation. It puts a little mark down here to show you where the home position is on your printer. So this is the front of the printer. Um, let's open up a model. I have, well, let's see, I know, let's, uh, let's pull in the coil form that I made in Tinkercad for a little regen receiver I'm working on. Um, out of Tinkercad, I exported this STL file. So we'll open that, and there's our part positioned in the center of the printer bed. 
Now we can move that around on the bed if we want to put it at a different place. And that's useful if you wanted to duplicate parts. If I wanted to print three of these, I could right click on it and select multiply. Number of copies to make two. There, it made two copies. Now I'd be making three of these at once. So you can lay it out on the bed this way. Um, delete key will let us delete a model. You can open multiple parts if you wanted to print several at one time. Let's say you had something that had three parts to it and you want to just print them all at the same time and instead of individually. You could open multiple parts and just lay them out on the bed the way that you want them to be. Over here on the right, we have print setup. Now, um, right at the top, there's a profile uh, setting. It's defaulting to draft quality. You can define as many profiles as you want with different sets of settings. So let's say I have an ultra fine setting with a, a half a millimeter, um, no, I'm sorry, a, a tenth of a millimeter layer height, which is really, really small and special speeds and everything to make it print fine. I could make a super fine quality profile, you know, and, and it would save all those settings for me. They've given us a few default settings extra fine, fine, low quality, draft quality, and coarse quality. Extra coarse. <laughs> with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, I don't think you'd get uh, a good print with extra coarse because <laughs> if it's moving the nozzle 0.6 millimeters above the previous layer, um, it would be basically dropping the filament down onto it and it wouldn't adhere. <laughs> so those are useless. <laughs> but uh, anyway, this is where you select your profile and, and the profiles that you define, ignore that, um, are going to change all of the settings below. So if I've changed a bunch of these settings, I can define them as a new profile up here um, by create profile from current settings. And our settings that are shown by default is layer height and you can see it gives us nice tool tips that tell you what that setting does and what it affects. Layer height is how far up it's going to raise the nozzle as it goes to draw the next layer. 0.2 millimeters, two tenths of a millimeter is what they consider to be draft and it's still pretty good. Um, the, that's a good print quality for just a rough part you're going to use for something simple. Um, if you're making a little stand for something for a phone or whatever, you're probably fine with that and you won't use as much plastic. So it's, it's all about, and, it, and it'll print quicker too, by the way. Um, the finer this layer height is, the longer it's going to take to print because it's got to do more smaller layers, you see. So if I increase that, double it, uh, or, or have it in size, I'm probably going to double my print time because it's going to be doing twice as many layers. Line width, um, yeah, you kind of want to leave that as the diameter of your nozzle. Um, you can decrease that and it's going to spit out a little less plastic, I think, to try to make that bead just a little bit smaller. Or if you increase that, it's going to ex extrude more plastic, which will fatten up the bead, you know. Uh, so that's what that does. I generally leave that at the diameter of my nozzle, which is 0.4 millimeters. Wall thickness, top and bottom thickness, um, they're exactly what they sound like. The wall around the outside of this print, um, when it draws the circle for that outer shell, that's how thick that's going to be. Top and bottom thickness, um, if you had a, a flat part that had a flat top on it, that's how many layers it's going to put on top or how, many, how thick it's going to make that. You know? So if you have a part that's going to be a model that's visible, a, a gaming piece, um, a show piece or whatever, and it's got flat areas on top of it, you might want to increase that top thickness a little bit just to, uh, to add a couple of more layers so you can't see through them to the infill pattern inside. You know, it just looks, it just looks cleaner. Z seam alignment. Um, when you're printing a, a, a circular object, a cylinder or a vase, if it always starts and stops at exactly the same place on that vase, you'll see a seam because the nozzle's always starting there and ending there. And so you'll see a seam down the side of the bottle. So with this set to random, if it's drawing a vase or a circular object, it's going to start and stop at a random place each time and prevent that seam. That's what that's for. Infill. 
Um, as I mentioned before, that's the, the filling inside of the model. And this is the percentage, how dense it's going to be. 20% is a pretty common setting. It doesn't sound like much, but believe me, it gives you plenty of strength. If I printed a, a circular object and it had 20% infill, it would look like a grid pattern on the inside. I, I could stand on it and it probably wouldn't crack. I mean, it's, it's really quite strong. But you can increase and decrease that there. Uh, one thing you might hear mentioned in other videos is vase mode. Uh, if you had a model of a vase and you loaded it up, unless you had specifically hollowed out the inside, it would want to print as a solid object. And the way you would get it to print as a vase would be to set the infill density to 0%, or in other words, hollow on the inside, and then you'd probably increase your wall thickness to one or two millimeters, and then that would give you a nice vase. So that's where infill is, is um, handy. And then infill pattern. There's quite a few different patterns. Um, where the changes make a difference is in the structural strength of the item as well as the outer side of it. Uh, if you have a certain infill pattern where the, the infill lines come to a point at the edge of your object and you don't have very thick walls, you'll see a visible line through that wall because they're all meeting along that, like a seam, but on the inside. So changing that pattern can, can help visually, and it can change the structural integrity of the object. Uh, you'd have to do some research on these different patterns and what the uh, pluses and minuses are of them before you'd want to change that. Grid, by default, works fine for most things. Um, material. This is another important area. This is the printing temperature of the nozzle. Now they put in 205 by default, which is pretty common these days. Um, I tend to print at 195C, and I haven't had any problems with layer adhesion. Um, you don't want to get too hot. Most PLA manufacturers will have on the label on the side of the spool a recommended printing temperature range. Um, I just opened some PLA that had a range of 205 to 215 was recommended. And printing at 205, I saw what looked like a little bit of, 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 little bit of melt on the sides of the seams where it looked like it was just a little too hot, but, but it printed okay. You generally want to follow those recommendations, but you don't want to get too hot. If you're too hot, the plastic comes out too runny, too uh, not viscous enough, and it can make a sloppy uh, print. And it can also ooze when the print head moves from one point to another, it stops extruding, but as it moves, gravity is gonna pull that out. It's gonna, the filament's gonna ooze out of the nozzle a little bit and you can get a little stringer drawn from one point to the other, like a little hair on your print. So if you're too hot, it can make for a messy print. So that's important. Also, different materials um, will require different temperatures. ABS plastic, for example, needs, I think, 235 degrees Celsius as a proper melting temperature. Same thing is true here with the build plate temperature if you have a heated bed. 60 is a good temperature for PLA. That heated bed is going to help keep the plastic slightly soft on that first layer so it doesn't cool and curl up at the ends. If you do a print and at the corners you see it curling up off the bed a little bit, um, you might not have your build plate temperature turned on or you might have it too low. If I drop that down to 40 C, for example, and printed a cube, then everywhere that there's a corner that would probably start to lift up just a little bit off the bed and curl up the, the, the corners. So that's what that's for. Um, some printers won't have heated beds. They'll use an active cooling fan to cool the filament as soon as it comes out of the nozzle so it doesn't um, shrink and that'll prevent that. So there's, there's all kinds of factors that can weigh in there. If you're printing with PLA plastics, definitely leave that at about 60 if you have a heated bed and you'll get good bed adhesion. It, the, your model will stick to the bed well and you won't get those curls up at the corner, generally. There are rare conditions where that can occur, but you probably won't run into it. Um, diameter is your nozzle diameter. Flow is a percentage of flow. There's some times where you might want it to squeeze out just a little more plastic or a little less plastic, but in most cases, you're just gonna leave that at 100%. Okay, enable retraction. 
almost always you're going to want that checked. Retraction is a method to help combat oozing. Remember I said when the nozzle is drawing apart and it has to stop drawing and move to another part of the uh, print, um, it'll stop extruding. Well, when it stops extruding, there's still melted plastic in that nozzle and gravity wants to pull it out. Retraction means if it's gonna move from one part of the print to another, it backs the filament up. It, it sucks it back in the nozzle just a little bit. And that creates some back pressure that will suck that, that oozing plastic back up into the nozzle. Retraction's important. If you have retraction off, you'll definitely get little hairs and strings everywhere that it moved at the nozzle. It'll, it'll stretch out just a little tiny bit of that plastic as it's moving. And so retraction prevents that. You want to make sure that's on. Uh, print speed and travel speed. These defaults are probably fine. That's how fast it's moving the nozzle. There are times where you'd want to reduce that print speed. If you were printing something that, that had, um, had a part that came up into a point, right? And that was the last part of the print, like a, a little soldier holding a sword and that sword sticking up above his head. Well, when the printer is drawing that tiny little bitty piece, it's gonna be sitting there and, and just doing layer, 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 layer and moving up and those layers below might not have time to cool you know, to, and harden. And you can end up with that tip kind of drooping a little bit and kind of oozing a little bit because the plastic just didn't have time to cool before the next layer was put on. So slowing down that print speed for fine, small, tiny things will help uh, the quality of the print. 45 is a pretty good speed. Um, I have found with the Monoprice Mini that I slow it down just slightly, 40, I get just a little bit cleaner prints. It, it gives the cooling fan just a little more time to cool that layer of plastic that just got laid down. Travel speed is how fast it's gonna move when it's moving from one part of the print to the other without printing. And 120 is a good speed. I wouldn't mess with that. If you go too fast, um, you can start getting your printer shaking, you know, because it's, it's, it's just moving too quick. Um, and it can cause, uh, banding uh, on the sides of the print where you get sort of a pattern on the side of the print because of the vibration. So you don't want it to move too fast. That shaking that, that can happen will cause some, some quality issues with your print. 120 is a good speed. You can drop it down or speed it up as you see fit depending upon your printer. Cooling. Print cooling is... Hold on. <coughs> <coughs> The more I talk, the worse my throat gets. Print cooling. Um, on most printers these days, at the nozzle, there's a fan. There should be two fans. There should be one to cool the upper part of the assembly where the plastic is coming down so it doesn't melt before it gets to the nozzle. But there's also a cooling fan for the print itself that will direct air down just below the nozzle. And that is to cool the plastic that has just been extruded. So the plastic beads come out, it's laid down on top of another bead, and then is immediately cooled by that fan so that it doesn't cool slowly and shrink and pull away or distort your print. So if your printer has a cooling fan, you definitely want that enabled. I don't know why you'd want to turn that off. Well, I guess maybe for ABS. ABS plastic has to stay at such a high temperature that a cooling fan can actually cause it to warp. So that's probably why that's there. But in most cases, if you're, if you're printing with PLA plastic, you'll leave the cooling fan on. Supports. Um, you can turn this on to generate supports. Now what supports are, let's say you were printing an object that had, um, had a part that overhanged another part, okay? It had, Wish I had something here to show you that would be a good example, but I guess I don't. Uh, let's say that you were printing a part and it had a piece that came up and then went over at a right angle, but there was nothing underneath it, right? There's nothing underneath here. Your printer can't really print that because when it gets up there and it moves the nozzle out, it's gonna be extruding plastic out into free space and it's just gonna fall straight down. There's nothing for it to, to lay that plastic on. Supports, means the printer will draw these thin little columns 
um, below it that'll come up underneath where that overhang is to give it something to lay the plastic on. And they are very, very thin, so after the print's done, you can just break them away. But that's what supports are. So that's important to know if you're printing any models that have an overhang, something that just sticks out in free space, you'll need support. Um, finally, build plate adhesion. Uh, there's a couple of things you can have it do um, when you print. Now I'm going to set this to a really large number here to show you over in the uh, preview window. Now let's go even higher. Oh, did I go too high? Is it going to show it to me? There we go. Um, build plate adhesion will do something around or under the model to help it stick to the plate. Brim, as you can see here, is a single layer brim like the brim of a hat that it draws around the model which gives it a larger surface area to grip the plate. If you had problems with something curling up a little bit at the corners, something like a brim might help you because that'll, that'll let the brim curl up out here and the main model back in here won't. Um, so that really helps in those cases. Um, you have to peel the brim off of the model and sometimes it's really kind of tough peeling it off right around the edge of the model. <coughs> the other types um, are skirt and a skirt. Come on. There we go. A skirt is good for, I use this, um, I use this fairly often. A skirt is good for priming the nozzle. Before it actually starts drawing my part, it's going to go out here and it's going to draw these three little circles around the outside of it. And that's going to let the plastic get flowing in the model, push out any debris or air bubbles that might be in there, so that when it moves in to actually start drawing the part, the plastic is flowing good, the nozzle is clean, everything is ready to go. And that'll give you a better first layer. So oftentimes I'll use a skirt just to, to clean out and prime that nozzle before it starts drawing my part. Um, I'd recommend using a skirt uh, to start with. It'll, it'll just give you some cleaner prints. Any, any goo um, or solidified bits of plastic that comes out will end up out in your skirt and not inside of your uh, model. Raft. Let it generate it. Come on. A raft kind of looks like a brim, except that it sticks up a little bit. Um, a raft is a pattern that uh, it sticks to the build plate, and then your model gets drawn on top of it, and you can break the model off the top of it. Again, it's another way to combat um, curling up corners and edges. Uh, a really difficult thing to print would be anything that has a little piece that sticks out, you know, like a, a, a foot with toes sticking out. Those toes might want to curl up, you know. Uh, so printing a raft will we'll lay out this pattern first and it'll be about a millimeter thick or less and then it'll draw the model on top of that. And so after the print's done then you just break the raft away from the bottom. Um, the bottom of your model might show some little bumps and things where the raft was. So that's what, that's what raft is. And it's, as I said, just another way to combat your model um, not sticking well to the print surface. And then, of course, there's none where it just, uh, just draws the model directly, starts printing it right away. If you have a really good printer, everything's tuned, everything works just fantastic with it, um, you can ignore these options for build plate adhesion. But at the minimum, I would recommend a skirt. Um, just to give that nozzle a, a, a cleaning before it starts printing your print. Okay, whew, man. So we've run through the basic settings, and this is just the basic settings, believe me. The slicer is the most useful piece of software, but also the, the place where you can get yourself into the most trouble. So, so definitely um, 
if you're a beginner, just start with the basic settings and you'll probably have some pretty good success with printing your prints. What else can I talk about in here? Well, let's see. Um, the types of views that it shows us are kind of useful. Uh, this is a solid view. And I can, uh, there's some little icons up here where I can just default to a front facing view, top facing view, side facing view, other side, or a perspective view. Um, x ray view lets you see through like an x-ray inside so you can see what's going on inside the model that could be useful in some cases <coughs> <coughs> i'm going to edit out a lot of coughs in this one um, if you had some parts of a model that are inside other parts like if you had a well one guy did a ship in a bottle where he actually printed a model of a bottle with a little tiny ship inside of it <laughs> and while he was positioning the ship inside of the other uh, their model here in Kira, the x-ray view allowed him to see you know how it looked and, and where it was going to fit. Layer view is kind of interesting. It'll show you um, the layers. Why isn't it rendering? Come on, slice. There we go. Okay. Layer view will let you actually see the individual layers as they are being printed. I can grab this slider here and I can just go down through the model and I can see the, the lines indicate the tool paths where the nozzle is going to be doing its job and drawing out the individual slices. Isn't that cool? So you, there's, there's, there's some uh, debugging you can do with certain prints, I suppose, by using this layer view. Um, yeah, there you can see in this coil form where it did a hole in the side of it here. See that? And you can see where the tool came out to draw this perimeter and it just did a right angle turn, another right angle turn, and came back along in the inside. Here's the second shell. And then here is infill inside of it. So I can see that it's filling in the inside of the model here with those yellow lines. So layer view can be kind of handy if you're, if you're trying to figure out exactly how the print's going to go and if you have any mistakes you need to think about as far as infill or support or whatever. So that's, that's a useful little view. So those are the views. Um, over here we have some tools. this okay uh, these are handy for uh, well moving I can I can dial in the exact place that I want it to, to be on the bed scaling you can scale a model now obviously if you're designing precision parts um, you don't want to scale things because then all your tolerances will be off but if you had something that you wanted to make smaller or bigger um, you could scale it here with the scale tool. Rotate lets you rotate a model on the bed. Sometimes when you're arranging multiple parts on the bed it's nice to be able to to take and stack them up in certain ways so the head doesn't have to move too far to uh, cut down on stringing and other problems. Um, and you might need to rotate them to make them fit you see. So it's all about laying parts out on the bed. Mirror. This can be handy. You can mirror an object in multiple directions. Um, I actually had to use that not too long ago for a part that I was printing for a friend. He um, needed a replacement toothpick for his Swiss Army knife. And the model that he found on Thingiverse was correct, except that it was flipped this way. And there's no way it would fit in his knife because of a little tab that stuck out that had to be on this side. Well, rather than having to remodel the whole thing, um, I was able to come in here and simply click that to mirror it. and it does exactly what that sounds like. It just creates a mirror image of it. It flips it over um, in a mirror direction. So that could be useful. And then uh, 
per model settings, um, you can change some of these settings for each of the models on the board. Uh, you'll never use that, <laughs> but it's there. Um, obviously, open would be to open a file for printing. Um, material, you can define different profiles for different materials. There's some defaults in here. Uh, I think in settings, material, manage materials, um, this is where you can choose. They've got profiles for various manufacturers. Um, you do need to go in here at least once and find a setting that's going to be the closest match to your material. Uh, that's just going to default things down here like print temperatures and so on to, uh, uh, to match for your material. Uh, in the case of the Monoprice Mini, it's really a PLA printer. You can print other materials with it, but it's not optimal for that. It won't do flexible materials because of the extruder and the Bowden tube and other various factors that I won't go into. But you do want to come in here and find a profile that's going to match your material. Um, generic PLA is really close for most standard PLA plastics and you're probably fine using that. Um, there are some other things in here. You can add, put in a filament cost and weight and Cura will try to calculate for you how much it's going to cost for the part you're printing. It's never all that accurate, but it's there. Um, in fact, speaking of calculations, if we look down here at the lower right, uh, this is where we save our G-code out, but beside it you'll see an estimated print time. This is always a pretty optimistic guess. It's say in 55 minutes, this would probably take a little over an hour to print. So uh, this is gonna be close, but it's gonna be a little optimistic. Okay, so we're done setting up our model. I'm sorry this is going long, I'm getting wordy again. But we're done setting up our model, we're ready to slice it. Cura has actually already sliced it for us. It does that automatically every time we make a change. And this button here, which is partially under my logo, save, well, it knows I've got something, a USB SD card plugged in, that's why it's defaulting to that. But we can save to file. This is where we will save out the resulting G code. If I select that, and I'll change the name of this because I don't want to overwrite my other one, test file. And you can choose where you're going to save it. This will be the G-code file that you will send to your printer for printing. So save this out, get it to your printer however you do. Um, most of them it's on an SD card. You'll save it to an SD card, plug that into your printer and tell the printer, go. Uh, in my case, um, the Monoprice Select Mini has Wi-Fi, so it's on my Wi-Fi network and I have a way of just sending the file right to it, which is very handy. I'm going to do another little video on that here shortly. But anyway, that's it. Once I hit save, I'm done, and I have a G-code file that's ready to go to my printer and print my part. So that is Cura in a nutshell for beginners. And uh, maybe it's helpful for some of you guys that uh, have been printing for a little while too, who knows. But that's slicing. And as I've said a couple of times, um, there's a lot of settings in here and you can very easily get yourself all screwed up and be getting garbage prints out of your printer. If that happens, um, just go back to defaults on the settings and start over. In most cases, the defaults in Cura are going to get you good prints right out, of the, right out of the gate. So, happy printing. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Also, if you're not already a subscriber, click to subscribe. Join us on the Facebook channel for discussion about the videos. And if you'd like to help support this channel, please click to support me on my Patreon page.